I'm joined by my guest, Nick Brana in Washington. He's the chair of the People's Party of the United States. In Raleigh, we have Ray McGovern. He's a former CIA analyst. And in Falls Church, we cross to Lawrence Wilkerson. He's a former chief of staff to Colin Powell. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in time you want, and I always appreciate it. Lawrence, if we can go to you first. Um, you know, we, this whole conflict has all been about, as far as I can tell, narrative control. So we have narratives like uh, Zelensky being pressured to have a counteroffensive, to grab back as much land as possible to enter negotiations. He says he doesn't have the, uh, the ammo uh, and other military hardware to, um, to fulfill that demand by the United States. We also have Secretary Blinken talking about um, the red line of Crimea, which again, it kind of throws a wrench into the works here. And then um, we have this, um, you know, whatever it takes mentality here from Washington. So what is going on here? Is Zelensky just trying to get NATO to formally uh, enjoin the conflict? Because that's exactly what it sounds like. Go ahead, Lawrence. I think you have to consider one of the most powerful elements in national security decision making that exists in my country, and that's domestic politics. Mm. You can't have wink and blinking nod and nudge, which is what I call President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, and Victoria Newland. Um, you can't interpret what they want to do unless you look at it through the domestic political lens. And right now, President Biden can't be seen in such a, I hate to say it, popular conflict as Ukraine has become with the electorate in this country. He can't be seen as cutting and running for it, from it or even uh, uh, negotiating over it. So it's a real problem for him politically, and that's a showstopper. Not to mention all the money the United States, defense contractors and others, are making off this conflict. Uh, that's a, a terrible disadvantage, too, if you will, to a negotiated settlement or peace. So it's domestic politics, it's money, it's reestablishing U.S. hegemony over the European Union and Europe in general. It's all these things that are keeping us from doing what we should do, which is sit down and talk. Okay, so if I got you right, so it's it's about a lot of things, but it's not really much about Ukraine. I got that. Ray, basically the same question to you. Asked differently, um, a long conflict, a long war. Who benefits from that? Is there what party in all of this benefits from a long war? Ray. Well, the party that says they're going to, uh, uh, to, to give it all, all they have for as long as it takes. That's clearly the, the party that benefits. Larry is quite right, and Putin has explicitly acknowledged that domestic politics uh, explain uh, a heck of a lot of why, what foreign policy makers uh, heed. Uh, I just add this. Uh, we're approaching the denouement in Ukraine. In my view, it will not be more than another month or so before Russian forces have decimated what's left of the Ukrainian army, and we'll have pretty much a, a freeway to the Dnieper River. Uh, that's going to be very embarrassing. Uh, that's going to happen, like, real soon, in my view. And uh, that's when Biden is going to have to decide what to do. And if he's guided mostly by domestic considerations, the temptation to up the ante still more will be even more intense. And that's precisely, in my view, why Putin said, we're going to put nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear warheads in Belarus, uh, because that's what the Americans have done in the rest of Europe. So we're upping the ante, too. We're, we're prepared to use them if you, if you really do very stupid things. So in my view, it's quite a dangerous thing, whether it's mostly foreign policy consideration based on domestic politics or whether it's this other strategic thing. Uh, Biden's not going to get off with this uh, easy because he's going to have to make <laughs> he. Uh, uh, Larry's right. It's not he. It's those other, that other crew. 
They're going to have to make decisions, and we'll have nothing to say about it. We we specialists in this area. Yeah, the the, the same crowd that pr probably was uh, made the decisions surrounding uh, the Nord Stream pipeline. So I'll leave it at that. There, uh, Nick. I mean, where is the debate about this? Okay, I mean, it, the, the debate about Ukraine policy. It's it's invading the, the GOP here. I've been watching them to, uh, bend themselves into a pretzel because Trump says one thing, and then we have dissent as another thing, and then you look at public opinion polls among GOP voters, this is not a popular war here. So it's invading domestic politics just in the same way that Larry and Ray have just said here. Go ahead, Nick. It's amazing. Um, the Democratic Party, which I used to be a part of until I left and helped form the People's Party, has become the party of outright unquestioned war uh, and and authoritarianism in in their censorship online of even any critic and their call for censorship of any critic of the war uh, and in working with intelligence agencies to uh, to enact that censorship. So you're right. There's been no public discussion or debate about the war in the first place. Uh, Ukraine, of course, doesn't have any interest, uh, the American public doesn't have any benefit in continuing the war. It's only the military industrial complex that benefit the members of Congress uh, from the Democratic and Republican parties that get the kickbacks. And I'll add to what uh, Larry and Ray said, and I completely agree with what they said. Uh, I would say that the U.S. is so invested in this, and so is the, the Pentagon, because they've staked American hegemony uh, on this war, and it's become incredibly symbolic um, after advancing NATO for 30 years uh, to Russia's border. When they lose this war, as they inevitably will, it will symbolize that the rest of the world is no longer kowtowing to American imperialism. That's why this is so dangerous, because hegemons don't like to lose their grip here. Larry, you know, one of the things, you know, you know a lot about the Iraq war. There's uh, the 20th anniversary of it. I don't like using the word anniversary. Um, 20 years ago, um, what has Washington learned since then vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Not a darn thing. Uh, it's simply <laughs> stated. Let me, let me just add to what Nick just said about the Democrats. I spent months, almost a year on the Hill, trying to get the Democrats, the Democrats, Pelosi, Hoyer, and others, to not subvert, but to help us use the War Powers Resolution to stop U.S. participation with the Saudis in the heinous, brutal war in Yemen. At the end of the day, when we finally got that passed, we only got it passed because Pelosi knew Trump would veto it. Otherwise, she would not have taken away her pressure to not let it even get to the floor. So the Democrats are as big a warmongers as the Republicans. They just sometimes pick different targets. And that's part of our problem in this country now. We have no political party of substance that is really interested in tackling the real threats in the world, which are in order of their existentialism, nuclear weapons and no treaty at all anymore in force and the climate crisis. So we have, an, we have a, a, a Luddite per blind legislature in this country. And that's what our founders meant to be, the entity in our government closest to the people, representing the people's interests. We no longer have that. Well, Ray, I mean, it's the U.S. Uh, and through NATO, they've made this existential, which was not necessary. This is a, they, they've made it existential for themselves. Russia obviously sees it that way. You know, one of the great breaks that we've seen uh, since the Second World War is that great powers don't go toe to toe. That's a no, no. You're not supposed to do that because you can lose. And when when one side loses, it could take everyone else with them. This is what this administration has done. Ray. Well, that's true. Uh, the sorry thing, Peter, is that these uh, well-heeled elite people who are running our policies don't seem to realize that it's mostly their fault. Now, when I say their fault, I, I refer not only to the, the fool's errand in Ukraine, but also to the fact they have put Russia and China together mm -hmm. in a way that China and Russia have never been together before, 
They have a virtual alliance. And who who is Biden or who are Biden's uh, gestures listening to? Former ambassadors who are saying, oh, Putin surprised, scooped, deceived Xi <laughs> last week uh, because he didn't say or he did say this. In other words, they lost the they lost focus on the big picture, which is a tectonic shift in relations. The fact that Russia and China are not going to abide by their core interests being sacrificed. He missed that big picture by by saying one little thing about emplacing nuclear warheads in Belarus. Ha ha! Putin did all see about that. He's so totally surprised. He boy, she, I'm probably very mad at him. That's the kind of counsel. Yeah. That's the kind of sophomoric advice that these uh, well-heeled people, uh, Blink and Wink and Nod or whatever their names are, are getting from academia. Well, you know, it, that, it's very interesting, Nick, here, is that we, there is no pushback here. There's, there's, you know, they always say, it's it, very interesting, and you know, you, they have to give the Russians an off-ramp here, but the U.S. The, the US elites have not given themselves an off-ramp here. I mean, they're, this is uh, the ultimate right. game of chicken. Rick, no, go ahead, Nick. Well, I completely agree with that, and they continue escalating. It's incredibly dangerous. You know, there there appears to be two different tracks. There's division, it seems, uh, in the Pentagon, even in the administration. There seems to be increasing division over what to do with this war because the mainstream media, which has just been selling this war from the very beginning, um, you know, peddling lies like, Russia has uh, uh, wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union and, you know, they're going to invade next thing you know, if, you know, if we don't stop them in Ukraine, the, you know, they're, they're going to be yeah, in yeah, Berlin. Nick, and Nick, I, I heard I heard a so-called talking head on Fox News on last news cycle that Poland is the next target. They give no empirical evidence why that's the case, but that's how they peddle it here. Gentlemen, I'm going to jump in here. We're going we're going to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the conflict in Ukraine. Okay, let's go back to Larry in uh, Falls Church. Larry, the, we uh, over the um, last uh, week or so, we had the ICC come back into uh, into action um, with uh, possible war crime indictments against individuals in Russia. As far as I know, once the ICC does that, it those charges are never rescinded. I mean, this is again deepening, widening the breach here of no return to any kind of amicable relationship between Russia and the West. And again, it's the West that wants this. They want a complete breach, okay? Hope thinking that, you know, Russia is isolated, but I would posit is that the more the US and its uh, NATO allies do this, the more they're isolated from the world, not Russia. Lawrence, go ahead. I have a very uh, jaundiced view of the ICC. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. I learned, I learned about it in 2001, 2002, and 2003, and I learned about it from a very, very good source, John Bolton, who was then Under Secretary of State for International Security and Arms Control. The United States did not subscribe to the ICC publicly because the United States knew that underneath the covers, as it were, it was going to influence the ICC to do its bidding. And that's precisely what it began to do. You notice we went after black African leaders. We didn't go after any white people until we got into the Balkans and we had people like Milosevic and Karadzic and others who were, quote, worth going after, unquote. The ICC was a tool of the United States in every respect, just as the UN is often a tool of the United States when it does its bidding. So the ICC is not something I look at as an organization fit to do justice in the world. And I'll give you an example, a concrete example. When I was in Paris in 2019, the Germans brought some people over to talk to us about torture. That was our ostensible purpose for being in Paris. But the Germans also brought a young lady who was a brilliant prosecutor for the ICC, and she was in the first stage of her investigation where prosecutorial regulations and rules don't really hurt the investigation. So she was free to do what she wanted to. She was bringing a case against the United States and others in Afghanistan. Well, you know where she is now. You know where that <laughs> case is now. 
So I don't look at the ICC as a bulwark of justice on the global face. Well, it's interesting that the ICC would rear its uh, head, Ray, because, you know, again, 20 years ago, the illegal invasion of Iraq and the uh, architects of that war um, have never been held account. No one, not one, okay? Not even the media, okay? And then the, uh, the ICC conveniently is deployed again, which I have to remind our audience, the United States is not a signatory to it, Russia is not, and neither is Ukraine. Go ahead, Ray. And just one other, just one other go thing. Ahead. Go the, ahead, Larry, go during ahead. This, yeah, during this time that I was learning this from Mr. Bolton, Mr. Bolton was going all over the world and bending capitals' arms and paying capitals of countries all across the globe to sign these agreements that guaranteed that were U.S. troops deployed on their soil, they would never bring prosecution against them. <laughs> Very convenient there. Ray, go ahead, jump in. Well, I have to agree that the ICC, uh, even other other parts of the UN apparatus are all tightly controlled by the US and the people they put in office there. There's one sort of uh, exception that are rising, and that is yesterday's vote at the UN Security Council uh, against, uh, well, the uh, three three major powers, not only Russia, but China, and Brazil voted to have a, an independent investigation of blowing up Nord Stream. Hmm, three powers. Did the others vote against it? No, it was too embarrassing to veto that kind of. No, they abstained. <laughs> so it was all right. Yeah. So things are things are changing a little bit. Now I want to raise something that uh, that Larry alluded to that I think is the the mother of all opportunity costs. All right. Uh, Larry mentioned it to his credit, environmental damage, climate change, whatever you call it. Uh, if you talk about Luddites, if you talk about people who shouldn't be Luddites, well-educated people like April Haynes, the head of our national intelligence apparatus, uh, she said something sensible, but it was two years ago, and she forgot about it. Here it is. Climate change knows no boundaries, respects no borders, and cannot be addressed by any one nation on its own. We must work together on the challenge before us, working with my colleagues and the whole government apparatus and foreign countries. We will meet this challenge. Whoa! Well, that ain't going to happen anytime soon if we keep uh, polluting the atmosphere, even to the extent of depleted uranium in Ukraine. So. I mean, I have 10 grandchildren. Doesn't anybody think about that? Well, you know, that's the mother of all opportunity costs. It should be in every conversation. Uh, forgive me for inserting it. No, in that's one. very important. I mean, Nick, you know, the blowing up the pipelines, Nord Stream pipelines, was an ecological disaster that nobody in the West has the courage really to talk about, okay? And particularly all the greeniacs, okay? And, and let's throw in the U.S. military is the biggest single polluter in the world, okay? But Nick, you know, since Nord Stream was brought up here, I mean, it, it, as, as Ray was pointing out, you know, and, and Larry, is that it's getting really embarrassing coming up with these alternative theories. Okay, because no one believes them. Okay, and then the hu great, the greatest humiliation of them all is that the Germans are still. Oh, maybe the Russians actually did do it. I mean, it's true. <laughs> it's tr it's absolutely extraordinary to look at these sophisticated people lie straight to your face. It's extraordinary to watch. And it's what it's American hegemony that has done this to Europe. Okay, it's so shameful when. Europe and we, you know, this, this this strategic alternative that they talked about not too long ago, where Europe would be a, a center of power along uh, along line the United States and China. That's all completely gone, and 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 they've they've been insulted by having their energy uh, independence um, questioned. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, and uh, they say that when the intelligence agencies in the United States want to. Uh, put out some kind of false propaganda narrative. They go to the New York Times first. Well, you know, they, that's exactly what we saw when they dutifully went to the New York, you know, the New York Times and uh, came up with this ridiculous story, probably even more ridiculous than the idea that Russia blew it up as uh, idiotic as that was, that there a, a Ukrainian Justice League uh, somehow 
pulled off uh, the biggest act of, you know, terrorism uh, since uh, 9-11. And it's ludicrous. And I want to add, too, to uh, what Larry and Ray said about the uh, ICC. The United States literally passed the Hague Invasion Act, an yep. act that allows it to violently invade the Netherlands to jailbreak any service yeah. member or american who the uh, that the icc attempts to try just three years ago the united states called the icc an embarrassment and said that it doesn't recognize its jurisdiction and so american hypocrisy is fully on display uh when it comes to that when it comes to the united states saying that it isn't going to support a ceasefire the whole world sees the u.s as uh, or much more of the world is seeing the U.S. as the aggressor in this war. You know, Larry, how worried are you about a false flag incident in Ukraine using a chemical, biological, even nuclear? Because, you know, we're getting we're, uh, between a rock and a hard place right now. I mean, any counteroffensive from Ukraine seems almost hopeless at this point. But whatever it takes narrative continues here. The only thing that can shake up that uh, narrative is something very, very dramatic. And it's to point out to our viewers that it's the losing side that re resorts to false flags. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, I would never discount that. I, I don't think it's a probability, but it's certainly a possibility. And let me just say what Nick was just saying and what Ray has said reminds me of a book I'm reading right now by James Shapiro, a really brilliant Shakespearean scholar who's writing, who wrote a book called The Year of Lear. And one of the things he goes through in that book is the Jesu Jesuit principle that developed in the early 1600s of equivocation, which essentially meant lying to protect the Catholic Church and to protect Catholics. It was forgiven by God. Indeed, it was sacred to lie in this way. That's what characterizes our politicians today. And that disturbs me more than almost anything else, because that's the end of our democracy if we don't stop it. And the media, instead of ripping that apart every day, as Julian Assange, for example, did, aids and abets it. You can't run a democracy that way. Ray, your, your thoughts on that. And I'm glad that Julian Assange's name has been brought up. I mean, um, it criminalizing telling the truth. It goes right in line with Larry, what Larry was just saying there. Go ahead, Ray. Well, there's another old Jesuitical um, precept called invincible ignorance. <clears throat> now, if you, your ignorance is invis invincible, <clears throat> we get off scot-free, end up in purgatory, not in hell, okay? <laughs> Now, these people uh, have invincible ignorance by virtue of their exceptionalism, their feeling that they really can still rule the world. Hegemony, it comes from the Greek word, to lead, but it also means to oppress. It also means to dominate, okay? That's over for the U.S. And the sooner that these young sophomores uh, that try to get Biden to do the weird things he does, as soon as they realize that, that's going to be okay for the world. If they don't realize that, the, the, the push is going to come to shove in Ukraine just in a couple of months now. And uh, hold on to your hat, because Putin, you know, his, his announcement that they're going to put uh, nuclear warheads in Belarus surprised me, okay? I'm always surprised at the next move that Putin makes. I don't want to be surprised by something even worse than that. But that's a, a, an earnest of his intentions. That's an earnest of the Russian outlook, that this is an existential threat for Russia. It's not an existential threat, except a political existential threat for the United States. Yeah, and, and, and we have to point out here, if you go through, we have very uh, learned and uh, literate uh, guests on the program here, but not once <laughs> in history does a, a, a hegemon go quietly. And I think that's what we're all worried about. And it's all the epicenter of all of this is in Ukraine, unfortunately. It was, it's been a conflict of choice, unfortunately. That's all the time we have, gentlemen. I want to thank my guests in Washington, Raleigh, and in Falls Church.